This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel! In this video, we're going to expand on something I touched on in the last 12 rules video, namely perceptual organization. And I'd hate to keep you in suspenders, so let's get to it! In my video on the cognitive revolution, I mentioned that gestalt psychology was big in Europe while behaviorism was having its heyday here in the US. And a central emphasis of gestalt psychology, especially for perception, is that we tend to see the whole rather than the constituent parts. Let's work through an example. The individual parts here are a bunch of black pie pieces, some more of the pie than others. But if we zoom this out to show all the pieces, a sort of three-dimensional square thing may become apparent. In the perceptual biz, this is known as a Necker cube. More on that in a second. So even though you're only actually seeing a variety of black pie shapes, you're able to perceive a figure in front of those black shapes. You're seeing a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts, a gestalt. An important lesson to take from this is that your brain is actively constructing your perception of the world, not just passively absorbing information as it comes in. We can talk about how the world is parsed through the Gestalt perceptual grouping rules. First, simplicity is almost like Occam's razor for visual perception. Occam's razor being a philosophical concept of the simplest explanation with the fewest required assumptions likely being the correct one. In perception, this means that you'll tend to see the simplest or most likely interpretation of something. For example, it's possible that this figure is only seeable from your current perspective and is just a convergence of a bunch of unrelated objects, or it's a single arrow shape. These coincidental configurations don't tend to happen naturally, so it makes sense to just see it as an arrow. Sometimes things will get in the way of what we're looking at, or it will be a little blurry or hazy, so parts may be missing. As such, we'll tend to fill in the missing info to have a cohesive object. This is known as closure. We're closing the gaps to perceive a solid object. Similar to simplicity, it's possible that a bunch of objects or lines are just lining up to make us think there's an object there when there isn't, but that doesn't tend to be the case. So much of perception is just playing the odds. If there's some ambiguity about edges or contours, we'll tend to use an assumption of the edge or curve continuing in a similar manner. Again, odds are that this continuity won't do us dirty when trying to segregate the visual world, but it is possible for it to be an illusion. We'll also tend to assume that things that are similar are part of the same object. The typical example here is of columns of differing shapes, but you can think of this for qualities like texture or shininess. Kind of like the last rule, we'll also use the proximity of objects as a hint that they're part of the same group. Last one we'll cover here is common fate. In this case, we use movement clues to group things. Parts that are moving together will tend to be perceived as part of one object. And now, here's an example incorporating a couple of those rules. I've motion tracked some footage from a YouTube video. What do you see? What do you think is happening here? I'll run it through a couple times to give you a chance to think about it. Surprise! It's a leopard walking. Being able to pick out and group the parts of the scene that could potentially eat us is a very useful skill to have. Perceptual grouping helps us pick out objects from the surrounding scene. Another way this is said is that we are separating the figure from the ground. There are clues other than the gestalt grouping ones to help us in this process, which we'll talk about in a second. First, a note that sometimes the relationship between the figure and the ground can be ambiguous, especially when mustache twirling psychologists are involved. The aforementioned Necker cube, now shown in its entirety, is an example of an ambiguous stimulus that results in a bistable image. Bistable meaning that there tends to be two percepts that a person can flip between. The flipping can be somewhat random, although it can be encouraged to flip depending on what part of the figure you're looking at. 
For the Necker cube, if you're looking towards the lower left, you'll typically see the lower face pulled towards the front. If you look towards the upper right, you can pull the upper right face towards the front. Lower face, upper face, lower face, yada yada. Something to take from this and the next couple of examples is that meaning isn't inherently baked into the object. It's something that we have to actively construct and put together. There are several neural processing steps that have to happen before we can pull meaning out of the stimulus. The figure doesn't have to be so bare bones for this to occur either. There's a classic old woman, young woman, which would sometimes give a subset of my class grief, so let's take advantage of technology if you're not seeing it. The closer old woman is facing towards the lower left and seems to be bundled up for a cold winter. You can see her eye, a large nose, and a mouth tucked into her jacket. In seeing the further young woman, it helps to think of her dressed in early 19th century stuff. She's got a feather in her huge hair hat situation, and she's looking away from the viewer so you can see her ear, jawline, and a little bit of her nose and eyelashes. I say closer and further because of the difference in face size. The older woman's face is much larger than the young woman's face, and since there isn't typically huge variability in how large someone's face is, there's an implied difference in proximity. As with the Necker cube, the image can flip between the two percepts on its own, or you can encourage it by focusing on different parts of the image. Last one is a fun example. Wolverine or Batman? Times two. You can see Wolverine staring at you straight on, or you can see two Batmen facing each other against a yellow backdrop. Something else I want to expand on are the cues that we use to make sense of depth. As described in the last 12 rules video, the world is in three dimensions, but that info gets collapsed into two dimensions when it hits the retina. But we don't walk around seeing the world in 2D, we're able to perceive depth. So how does this happen? Trixie little brains being all tricksy. We can break these depth cues down into monocular, meaning it requires just one eye for the depth cue to work, or binocular, meaning you need both eyes for it to work. Monocular depth cues rely on assumptions about how the world tends to look and operate and are fun to illustrate with illusions that break those assumptions. Relative size requires some knowledge about how big certain things tend to be. For example, adults will typically be somewhere between 5 to 7 feet tall. So if you see a person who is quite large compared against another person, you'll tend to assume that the taller person is closer and the smaller person is further back. You also probably won't see the smaller person as being really that small, but if we strip out other depth cues, hilarity ensues. A related depth cue is relative height. Things that are further off tend to be further up in the visual field. I made use of this in the earlier animations. To help represent depth, some trees were further up the frame than others, in addition to the size difference. When generating illusions for these, relative size and height tend to go together to get the biggest effect. Another monocular depth cue is interposition. In this case, one object blocks the view of another. When this happens, we assume that the blocked object is further away. Even though it's possible that things are just happening to line up that way and that nothing is actually being blocked, the odds of that happening are pretty low. Linear perspective is the general environmental feature that parallel lines appear to converge in the distance. You've probably seen this with train tracks or straight highway stretches. These monocular depth cues can be used, well, exploited, for visual practical effects. One example is from the Lord of the Rings movies, especially in shots with the hobbits is. Construct the set in such a way that the hobbit is sitting further away from the camera and is staged with larger props. The Lord of the Rings went a step further in having a finely tuned moving set so the camera could move around the scene without breaking the illusion. In the fires of Mount Doom, taken by Isildur from the hand of... The big binocular death cue is due to the positional difference between our two eyes. This retinal disparity means that the image being sent to the brain from each eye is slightly different. If you've somehow never done this, you can check it for yourself right now, using your fingers. So arm out in front of you, look at your finger with one eye, and then switch which eye is open. And as you switch between which eye is open, it'll look like your finger is moving back and forth in space in front of you. A more advanced demonstration of this is the floating finger sausage. To achieve this one, just point your index fingers at each other without touching. And don't look at your fingers, look past them. You do this right, you should see a little floating finger sausage between your hands. And this will help illustrate how retinal disparity is used as a depth cue. 
When you bring your floating finger sausage closer to your face, it appears to get much larger. And when you pull it away from your face, it looks like it gets really small. The change in floating finger sausage size is due to the difference or disparity between the two images being sent to the brain, with a greater difference meaning that the object is closer to you and a smaller difference meaning that the object is further away. You get far enough out and there won't be much of a difference, if any, between the two images. Pretty close to you and there's going to be a sizable difference. And now we come to another instance of technology marching on, making me feel old as dirt. In the olden days, we would talk about retinal disparity as being the thing that made Viewmasters work. Are they even still a thing? Hey, look at that, still a thing. Although the VR rebranding is kind of cute. Anyways, this is also what makes the VR headsets work. Displaying slightly offset images to the two eyes to mimic the retinal disparity, leading to the perception of depth. So yeah. Those are some of the shortcuts and assumptions our brains make in order to make sense of and parse the world. In general, they tend to work out just fine, but in certain circumstances, particularly artificial ones like illusions, they can do us dirty. Wrap up YouTuber stuff. Like if this video was edutainful. Subscribe for more cognition and perception content. You can also find me on Twitter, my Discord server, or on Patreon. Ooh. Links for those are in the description and yeah, see you guys in the next video. Bye.